to you, but if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and it's right up there, so that's great. It came to pass, when the time was come, that he, he is Jesus, should be received up. And he steadfastly set, set his face to go to Jerusalem. Let me just take this moment with you and give you a little background here. Jesus knew his time was almost up. He knew that he only had a little bit of time with his disciples. Uh, soon he would be facing the journey to Jerusalem. He was on his way. And any time the Bible talks about Jerusalem, I thought they would be rejoicing and excited. How many here remember the days of Camp Meeting? Here in Florida Conference or in other states. For most of the pastors, I include myself among those, uh, Camp Meeting was, had mixed emotions. Because in southern New England, that's uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, that makes up the conference there, you had to spend a week in preparation for the week that was coming of Camp Meeting. And then that week was a week that I considered a week of sweating and crying and bleeding. If the splinters from the poles old poles, and I think went back to the 1800s that we had to put up with the tents. And the, I always considered camp meeting the time when you donated blood. <laughs> Involuntarily, too. Uh, at least for, from a past over. But it was a wonderful time. And you interacted and met a lot of folks. In fact, you couldn't take a lot of steps. Uh, very, you couldn't go very far because someone would pop up and you would start talking and before you knew it, uh, it, was, it was already time for the worship service. Jerusalem was the place that folks came to from all over to spend it together during these major feast days like Passover, like Pentecost. Uh, well, Jesus would also, as, as a Jew, travel to Jerusalem. And he did when he was a young boy with his parents the first time. And the gospel tells us of that experience. If he must have been so busy he got lost, or his parents thought he got lost. But Jerusalem also conjured up a lot of other emotions. To go to Jerusalem sometimes meant that, that you would also enter into a lot of gossiping, <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, nitpicking, and Jesus had so much opposition in Jerusalem. He didn't live in Jerusalem. He lived in Capernaum, and he lived where the disciples lived. The majority of them lived up there, and so they spent it up there. But he would go to Jerusalem faithfully as a Jew to worship, to carry out what his father had in store for him. When he went to Jerusalem, he went through persecution. He went through attacks. But this would be the final one. This would be when it finally wraps up and Jesus would ultimately give his life outside the city of Jerusalem. And it says it came to pass, let's go back one more, just to the one we had. It came to pass uh, that the time was come that he should be received up and he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He's determined on going to Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us that the apostle Paul knew that the Spirit told him that when he went to Jerusalem at the end of his ministry, he also was going to face hardship. Let's look at the next one. And he sends messengers before his face, and they went and they entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Now, um, I have the New King James. This is the King James Bible version. It, it reads uh, pretty close, except um, some of the wording at times is a little more of a contemporary change. Here it says, And he sent messengers before his face, and as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. So Jesus sends messengers. It doesn't tell us how many, 
but he sends them ahead so that they can go to the village in Samaria, to the people of Samaria, the Samaritans. And it says they were going ahead to prepare the village for Jesus, for Jesus coming. Jesus once made it very clear. He told a woman, a Samaritan woman in Gospel of John chapter 4, he said to this woman that the message that salvation itself has been first given to the Jews. In fact, on a certain occasion, a group of folks, non-Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, came to Jesus and they wanted Jesus actually to go with him. And Jesus said, no, I must go about carrying out the mission of his father. Jesus knows that the time is short. And even though Jesus, according to the prophecy in the book of Daniel, it tells us in Daniel chapter 9 that the Messiah would come and he was going to get the people, Israel, get them back on track, speaking to them, teaching them, the things of God. In fact, quite honestly, who is it that needs the message more than anyone else? It's those who have heard it before. Those who have heard it the first time, and the second time, and the third, and fourth. And for how many has it been the hundredth or the thousandth time? Who needs it? Who really needs it more than anything? Well, I have to say the whole world does. But the Lord Jesus knew he needed for, it says, seven years, the Messiah. But in the midst of the seven years, we understand it speaking um, in, the, in the book of Daniel, that his life would be cut what? Short. It would be cut off. In the midst of it, that leaves us with what? Three and a half. And for three and a half years, his public ministry was to the Jews. The Bible, the gospel says, he came to his own, and what was the result? They received him not. But the good news is, as many received him, to them he gave the right to be called sons and daughters of God. Amen? Amen. As many as received him. Truth of the matter is, we want everyone to receive Jesus Christ. The Bible says, go therefore and make disciples of how many? All. all. Because the good news is for all. The reality is, not all will see it as good news. But he comes to his own because it was to a people. Not because they were the greatest. Not because they were the brightest. Not because they commanded the most powerful army. They did not. In fact, quite honestly, the most insignificant and maybe in comparison to the nations, they would have been considered pathetic in numbers, in military, in every aspect. But God chose to reveal himself to a group of people we've come to know as the Jews. And that through them, they would be a light. They would be a lighthouse. They would be... A, a, a living testimony, a, a message, a billboard to the world about the nature of God, about the everlasting mercy and love of God. And Jesus knew he had to come and show them. You see, how often do we take for granted, in even take for granted our own family? How often we take for granted that which we've been blessed with. That which we've been recipients of. How many times God pours upon us as individuals and as, 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 as a family member and as, a, as a, a spiritual family, He pours such amazing grace, amazing love, and, and patience, and, and we lose sight of it. And we end up complaining. We end up pointing fingers. We end up sometimes, you know, with pity parties. 
and woe is me, and, and just, oh, I'm all alone. Have you ever had one of them? I'm all alone, and everyone's against me. We, we think it, we act it, our attitude conveys it, and they have received the Israelites so much. And God was pouring it out even more. In fact, the Bible tells us that it wasn't enough that God sent prophets. God had to send the clearest message to his own of how much he loves us. And that's why Jesus had to come. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to paint the sky in such beautiful colors. It wasn't enough to show us the depth of the ocean and to use it as an illustration that even our sins could be and would be tossed to the very depths and never come up. It wasn't enough that God would speak for so many years through women, through men, and even through a donkey. It wasn't enough that God would convey through endless ways. He needed to give them final proof. How great is his love. That's why God sent Jesus. That's why the Father sent the Son. But the Son, true to the Father, true to the heart of the Father, faithful in all things as a son to all the things of what it means to be part of his family, he came to share to as many as would receive it. And in his final act, Jesus is wanting to carry a message to the Samaritans. He sends messengers. He sends them off. He's telling them, go. He knows it's close. He says, prepare for me. If Jesus told you to do something, wouldn't you do it? If he personally said to you, I want you to carry this out. And you know, he is saying repeatedly, this is the end for me. I'm at the final moment. I want to carry it out. I want to see it fulfilled. If Jesus says that, I believe in our hearts we would say, yes, Lord. When Jesus had a moment with him, he says, listen, I, have, I, I want you to go and prepare a room because we're going to have the Passover meal. And the Bible tells us that they went and he told them who they were to see and that the person would have things all ready and the disciples carried it out. Jesus has something in mind. He says, go tell the Samaritans, prepare. How was it this morning getting ready to come here? Was it easy? Somebody had it easy? Yeah? It's good because it, it's easy when you kind of prepare for it, right? <laughs> Ahead of time, right? And you, you get everything all set and, and, and you know during the week that this moment will come and, and what it's going to take. And Oh, it's not only preparation physically, isn't it also mentally? Uh, does somebody have a hard time? Well, I, 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 I often have a hard time, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, someone was just sharing with me how even coming into this moment sometimes is, is coming into the body of Christ and the, the congregation, but they have just left the heat of battle inside the car. You know? They, they came short of smacking everyone in the car. They, <laughs> there, were, there, was, there was issues and things just come up, you know, and that happens, especially as a Sabbath job. And so preparation and preparation. And Jesus is asking for a preparation because he's coming in to these folks and they, his disciples, can make a difference. But let's turn to the next text. And it says, and they, the Samaritans, did not receive him, Jesus. Because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. The New King James says, he, they saw him and they saw he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Here's what happens. He sends messengers. He sent disciples. That's the messenger. Disciples. Remember Jesus said, um, follow me, right? And I will what? Yeah. You may be in a different occupation, 
Uh, you may have a certain profession and you have the degrees to show it and prove it. You have skills and you've gone through so much training. But the bottom line is, you're all fishermen. And you all should smell like fish. <laughs> fishermen smell like fish. If they don't smell like fish, then boy, they're, they, they, maybe they're just sitting behind a machine that does all the work. But Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. And when he went and he sent off his disciples, he told them, prepare for me. I'm coming in. And if you follow along, the message that he gave to them is an ongoing message because the Bible said that when Jesus first appeared, heaven made, sent an angel, a messenger to, to a family. It was a woman named Elizabeth and a husband named Zacharias. And that family was to have a child. The woman could not have a child. Elizabeth was barren. But the Lord said, this, your wife, will conceive. And she will give birth to a child. And he will be mighty before the Lord. For he will prepare the way for the Lord. And we know that man to be John the Baptist. And Jesus said to his own disciples and to everyone else who was around, when John the Baptist was imprisoned and later, or, or it came to the moment where he was, his head was cut off, he was beheaded. And he said about John, there is no greater man than John the Baptist. No greater individual, except of course the Lord Jesus. And why did Jesus say that? Because if John had not been faithful to what God wanted John to do, then the coming of Jesus would have had less of an impact upon those that did. You follow me? So the way the Lord looks at someone who prepares the way for him, for Jesus to come to meet people and interact and touch their lives, is so vital that what Jesus said of John, he wants to say of every single one of us. And so when he sends the Samaritans, he sends his disciples to them, and he's coming into the town. The Bible, the text says, and they all ran out, and they threw themselves at the feet of Jesus, and they embraced him with everything they had. Amen? Amen. Does it say that? No. It doesn't, does it? My brothers and sisters, my friends, there is failure in this final moment before Jesus goes to Jerusalem. What was Jesus expecting of these messengers? Prepare. Get the people ready. I'm coming to them. But what Jesus finds, doors are locked. No one, I don't know if they had blinders or shutters and they were peeking behind, but Jesus comes to the town, to that village, and he is not wanted. Now the Bible tells us that Jesus had a large number of people follow him. Remember the stories? In fact, he was so popular, he was so popular that people feared that if he, uh, especially the people I'm referring to was the religious leaders. Jesus, he was up there, okay? He was at the top. Everyone was coming out to Jesus, and they were afraid. That's why there was a plot to get rid of him. Jesus is coming close to the end of his ministry, and it seems like the poles are showing. It's down with Jesus. And he sends these, and nothing works. Someone once said to me that, that in, in ministry and in Christian life, sometimes we're always looking at all the successes. And we always talk about success, but we don't talk about failure. And the truth of the matter is, we face failure every day of the week. 
Have you? The truth of the matter is, there's a, there's a, 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 a Christian writer who wrote a book, What to Do with Failure, because he says, I fall down so often that I've decided I might as well do something when I'm on the ground. <laughs> Make it worthwhile. <laughs> so we fail. We all fail. And we fail in our walk. We fail in the, in the goals and in the, the things that we set before us we're going to accomplish. And the disciples have failed. And it might appear that Jesus has failed too. In fact, you look at Jesus' ministry. He had so many folks following him. At the end, he had so many running away from him. You would think the Lord Jesus has failed. That's what the Satan was saying to Jesus too. They're not going to follow you. There is no way. But here in this story, we see something that I believe is an important lesson because what went wrong? What went wrong? Let's look at the next text, 54. Look as the disciples are reflecting on what has happened. The people are not out. And James and John saw this. And they said, Lord, will you... Will you allow us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah the prophet did? You know what the disciples are saying? Hey Lord, just say the word and we're going to pray and it's going to be a barbecue right now. We're going to have them singed, Lord. The disciples are beside themselves. They're upset. Because they look at what's happened and they're angry. They're disgusted. The disciples recognize something is wrong. We need fire to take care of this. Let's look at how Jesus responded. But he turned and he what? You. It wasn't like he didn't do one of those. He rebuked them and said, You know not, you do not know what spirit, what manner of spirit you have. In other words, Jesus is turning to them. They are like Peter. Remember when, when Peter would say something really neat and Jesus said, Oh, Peter. What you have said, it comes from God. I bet Peter was like, his head swole up, and he was like, yes, Lord, amen. But then Peter would open his mouth, and the next thing he would say was really messed up. You know, he would say, oh, Jesus, no, let no thing bad happen to you. You are the Son of God. No, no, no. And Jesus would say, oh, get, get, get away from me, Satan. <laughs> the disciples, they believed that their attitude is right. Have you ever gone and knocked at somebody's door to make a <coughs> survey church-wide or, or to give out some literature? And, you ever had the door, the door slammed on your face? Yeah? Or the door never opened? Or somebody insulted you? They did open, they told you something, where to go? You ever had that? And how do you feel? I mean, honestly, maybe we feel like, I'm wiping my feet, let the fire come. <laughs> because naturally, we don't like being rejected, do we? We don't like rejection. We deal with rejection, with rejection in many ways. And so we feel, this is so important, this is the cause of Christ. Why don't they see it? Why don't they have love for Jesus? Why can't they open their hearts? What is wrong with them? You know what? It's over. That's it. No mas. Destruye. Venga fuego. Let fire come. It's over. And that's how the disciples feel. Just, that's it. Remember the story of Mount Carmel? They remember it. They're saying, Lord, we want to just pray. Kill my enemies. Kill my enemies. They were, they were quoting David in the Bible. Except they don't realize that if you look at David's prayers for his enemies, he starts off pretty angry. 
asking for the Lord to, to do things to his enemies. But if you read on, you start to find something about David in his prayers. You know, prayer changes and makes changes. Amen. You believe it? Amen. But where prayer first starts is not who is it we're praying for as much as who's doing the praying. Praying is to change the one who's praying. I think of another man. Another man who was in the presence of a town. A wicked town. And evil people live in that town. And the Lord opens his own heart. And he turns to this man. And he says, will I hold back from you what I'm about to do? That man, of course, is Abraham. And the Lord says, Abraham, I'm going to to rain down fire. I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Lord just drops the bomb on, on, on Abraham. You know, it's like, what? I'm going to wipe him out. And then Abraham starts to, I imagine him pacing back and forth, and he's like, this is weird. This, is, this, this can't be. Um, how are you going to, Wait, how, what, what about, Lord, could I talk to you? Listen to this. If there are about 50 people in that town, uh, and they have their heart open to you, will you destroy? And, and there's this whole dialogue back and forth, and the Lord is saying, no. If there are people there that their hearts are open and willing to come to me, I will not. And he goes all the way. <coughs> Abraham wrestles with God. Abraham is, 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 is pleading with God. And he, he, can't, he can't get it. He can't wrap his mind that God delights in destruction. He can't reconcile it because that's not the one who he has come to know. In fact, honestly, this, this story in the account of Jesus' final days is again a revelation because I believe the disciples didn't get it. And may I say, if the first century disciples didn't get it, could it be possible that every succeeding generation, even to the 21st century, we might not get it? That God is not in the business. Look at the next verse. For the Son of Man is not come to what? But to save. The disciples, I don't know who they, well, there's two that speak up. James and John, right? Are those are the brothers. Are those the brothers? Yeah, what were they called? Boy, they love thunder. The sons of thunder. Real mean boys. Bad boys. And, and, and it looks like in the three and a half years with Jesus, you wonder, shouldn't, shouldn't some things have rubbed on from Jesus onto these guys? At the core, they still got a mean streak, don't they? They're vengeful. I imagine Jesus is telling them stories and sharing about the kingdom of God, and they're sharpening the sword. Oh, yeah. This is for one of those heathens. They are. They, they don't get it. And they haven't gotten the message. When Jesus was saying, go to the village, prepare. Could it be possible, church, that the issue is that the ones who went to the village their heart wasn't right? That when they went to the Samaritans, they did not in any way help. <clears throat> Let's talk about the Samaritans. These people are relatives of the Jews, right? Yes. They don't like the Jews, do they? And quite honestly, the Jews don't like them either. And the, the Jews have made it known. 
We'll take your money. We'll, we'll barter and do stuff, but we don't want you in our house. You people. You ever heard of one of that? You people? You people. And we. And this whole wall of separation between each other. And here the disciples, Jesus is showing them over and over. He has no favorites. He does not discriminate. He will welcome anyone from any background. But the, G, but the disciples of Jesus have hang-ups. And they have habits. And they have hurts. And all of these things is the walls that keep them from them. It's the walls that keep them from Jesus. It's the walls that continue to separate and destroy. And Jesus is sending them out. And there are issues that Samaritans have. Who doesn't? Anyone here that doesn't have isn't a bigot. Are there no bigots here? Anyone with prejudice? Are you prejudiced? No? Stop lying to yourself. <laughs> we all have it. <laughs> we all have it. It is, it is fascinating. People watching is an exciting sport, may I say. And not only people watching, but listening to people. And by the way, if you've ever done it, there's someone who has done it for a longer time called Satan. And he knows everything about the human race. He knows all our issues. He knows how we'll turn on each other. He knows how we will band together. If there is a man who has hurt a woman, that woman will find another woman to gang up on that man. If there is a, a something between an ethnic group and let's say, let's say if the issue is not black, uh, it's black with white or against white or whatever it is. There will be a moment that after they had their issues, let's say my brother will say to another brother, well, I don't think you're black enough. I don't think you're down enough like we are. And so there'll be division within the same group. I remember one time, I told you that, the brother, Latino brother comes to me and says, I don't know if I like being part of the same conference. We should start a Latino conference. And I said, that sounds good. A conference where we don't discriminate? <laughs> Well, we won't pick and gossip and tear each other apart like we're doing already. <laughs> they didn't like that. <laughs> because even among the different groups, there's issues. And I shared this with our congregation in Titusville. Racism and all these, they're not about race. It's about pride. It's about power. The race is not, it's not about the races. It's just that we're not running in the same direction. And there's only one direction we have to run to. The direction of Jesus. Amen. We need to run to Jesus. And the disciples are still allowing their upbringing, their social environment to influence and dictate their views. And that's why the Word of God, Paul says, be made new in the spirit of your mind. Because it's not about this. And it's not about, and I don't got a lot of anything here. It's about this. It's about this. That's why Jesus is telling them, go and already we saw in the text that the ones who went do not care for those people because they were so quick to pass judgment. The real heart of the disciples. And these two, 
I think they just reflect. You ever had somebody say, well, we got an issue. Everybody's upset about this. Well, not everybody's upset, but you're the one voicing it. You're definitely upset about it. <laughs> but you, before you know it, yeah, you're going to tell all the others so they can be upset with you, too. And you got to spread it. Do these two disciples seem to be echoing the mindset? Hey, they have all these, they think they're better than each other. They may be part of the same group that's followers of Jesus, but they are as divided as divided can be. Because when push comes to shove, they're going to look out for who they believe is numero uno. And it's themselves. And if they can't get it, they're going to call mommy. Mommy, did you go see Jesus? And they call mommy, and mommy comes, and she starts to say, Jesus, my, my boys have given everything up for you. What's in it for them? Could you put them on the right and the left? Human nature, isn't it? When push comes to shove, we look for our own. And our own is really our own skin. Our own survival. And the disciples have gone. But when they went, who went to the village? The very same spirit. The very same attitude. The very same hang-ups. The very same habits. The very same hurts of the people that are in that village. So the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I did not come for those who are well. I came for those who are sick. And the master came to those who are sick. And may I even say, and I pray, that we become sick and tired of living in the same world of brokenness and hang-ups and habits and hurts that we wallow in and we're just trying to do cosmetic changes for we above all people need changing in our hearts Amen. we need it and Jesus comes to us because he wants it and he can deliver it and when he, he calls men and women he takes us where we are and then he says and I will make the creator can make and the creator can remake us he is able to take us and he is able to take our lives and he can change it. He can make us vessels of blessing to the villages that are around us, folks. The Samaritans, Jesus wanted them to be saved. It took a woman. It took a woman who was broken. It took a woman who understood finally the man who was before her. It took the woman who came to realize that she, like all others, was trying to fill the void of her heart. But she needed a man. But she didn't need an ordinary man. She didn't need a sexy man. She didn't need a wealthy man. She did not need an educated man. She needed but one man. And one man walked into her village. That one man changed her life. That one man informed her life. That one man promised her and said, I can deliver. All others will fail. All others fall short. This woman, with all her hang-ups and all her walls, confronting Jesus, let it all down. And that woman's life was changed. What happened one day, we are told that as that woman came to that experience with Jesus, she told her own, come and see a man who knows it all about me. And you know what the beauty of it? He not only knows it all, he'll still take it all. He won't reject anything and embrace us where we are. And in the master's hand we're changed. She found hope. And what she wanted to do was just give it away, share it with others, share with others of that. And what she did, they all came out. It says they came out 
They wanted it. You put that verse back, the last one. Look at that text. I did not come to destroy. I came to save. And so, as we look at this, I'd like to ask you a question. As the Lord is now coming back, what kind of messengers will go out? What kind of messengers are out in the community? What kind of messengers will we be? Will we be the ones that will take good news of what the Master has done with us? Or will we take a version of, of a message dressed up in our own prejudices and in our own hang-ups and in our own habits and hurts? Will we present to the hungry and thirsty and hurting us? Or will we give them us in Jesus? Amen. I believe that if we take time to think about what are those things that we've been holding on to, that just doesn't add up <clears throat> to the teachings of Jesus, and we will willingly surrender it, we'll change. We'll change our mindset. Peter, oh, Peter was so close to Jesus. There was about three that were very close, close circle. And even after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I always thought the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would do it all. Peter still had his hang up about these non-Jews. And Jesus had to give him a vision. He had to upset his nap. <laughs> and he had to show him, Peter, I want you to take and receive something. And Peter said, no. He saw a blanket with meats and all types of animals. And he said, I've never, as a Jew, ate anything like that. And I won't. And Jesus says, Peter, take and eat. And then, when he woke up, a man comes to him. And by the way, the Lord said, don't call unclean what I'm clean. Yes. And the man comes to him and says, my master says, come to his home, Simon Peter. By the looks of it, that man representing the master does not look Jewish. That means the home is not Jewish. And Peter goes, but he's still beside himself thinking, what is God doing? When he enters that home, and he starts to share with these people, and they're all like looking at him. Men, women, children, servants, the, the, the leader of the home, the father. And he says, Simon Peter, the Lord sent me, told me to send for you. And Peter realizes, this is a God moment, isn't it? God wants to do something with these people. And in that moment, as he started to share about Jesus, boom, 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 these people start to receive the Holy Spirit. And he then says, truly, God does not have, God doesn't favor one person over another. Whoever receives Jesus, to them does he give the gift of his indwelling presence. I would say, Peter, you got it. Go all the way to the book of Galatians. Peter understood it here, cognitively. Just like you and I sit in church, and we go through Bible studies, 
and we'll say, I got it. I got what that message is. But you know where the real place of learning is? It came one day. He's sitting at a table with non-Jews eating. They've come to Jesus. They've accepted Jesus. They're part of the family. They're together. And Peter has some Jewish friends who are not too happy with this group. Because they're not, they're not Christian enough. And when Peter sees them, he goes, hasta la vista. And he moves away. Because he was afraid. What will my friends think? What will they think of me? What will they say? We'll say that today too. Me interacting with these folks, what will my mother have to say? What will my other friends think? What about my position? Peter didn't get it, and it took a scolding from God. Paul gets up and says, you are a Jew, and yet you act like someone who has not understood the plan of God. How can that be? How can you tell these people that they need to come to salvation? You know who is far from salvation? Peter. Why? Because Peter was allowing his heart and the views of the world to dictate. Peter changed. Peter's life changed. Peter became an incredible messenger to the Jews and to the Gentiles too. It wasn't just Paul. Peter had his place. So, what are you going to do? What can you do? I want you to take this and I want you to think about it. Don't think about what the hang-ups and hurts and habits and issues of the person next to you is. I want you to think about your own life. What are some of those things that you have been made aware of by God's Spirit, you're still holding on to. They just don't go according to what Jesus taught and the way He lived. And if maybe you're saying, I don't think I have any hang-ups and hurts and habits and, and all these prejudices and bigotry and all the stuff you're talking about, Pastor. I don't believe I have any of it. Then I would ask you to pray. Search me, O oh God. And believe me, if you do, and you're willing to pray that prayer, God's Spirit can search. And He will bring it to you. And if all, if all you can do is say, okay, and face it, in the face of Jesus' true nature and His teachings, and turn it over, when He comes back, you will have many people from the various places at his feet because you are willing to let go for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, I thank you for this time together. Our thought this day is about our hearts, no different than the disciples' hearts. And yet, your heart is so tender to your children and to anyone who would receive you. Lead us in the time of meditation and reflection in the course of this day, in the course of this week, from this moment we've had together. Purge our hearts. Pull out. Reveal. Remove. In fact, replace it with the heart for people, for others that Jesus demonstrated in his life, in his ministry, in his death, in his resurrection. And even still today, the Son of Man came not to destroy, but to save. Save us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.